Hi, this is Mariah Gullo from The Hollywood Reporter, and I'm in studio with Eugenie Afinievsky. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you're the director of Cries from Syria, the documentary that's on HBO. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, how this documentary came together. You know, I think people know and familiar with my previous work, Winter on Fire, mm -hmm. that I did in 2013, 2014, and finished in 15. Mm -hmm. And uh, finishing the Winter on Fire and being in European Union, and Ukraine is a part of European Union, and story of Winter on Fire is uprising that happens in Ukraine, I was witnessing a couple of things. First of all, I, for the first time, I saw the Syrian flags on Maidan. I even saw the mm. guys, Syrian doctors, who've been on Maidan because the, a lot of people from Syria studied medical schools in Russia or in Ukraine. So it's oh. interesting. So I saw Syrian flags, I guess, in solidarity on Ukrainian Maidan in February 2014-15. Uh, uh, and it was interesting that in 15, almost every headliners of the newspapers were screaming, oh, Syrian refugees come and they're invading our cities. And, and I'm talking about European Union. They bring in their culture, they bring in Islam, it's a terrorism. So people were scared of these people. Yeah. So I started to do research as every filmmaker. And I found out that most of the people whom I met were different than the Syrians. They're not very Syrians. They were either from Afghanistan, from Iraq, or people from Africa even. Mm. And somehow entire media was putting a frame around them as Syrian refugees. Now, I do saw Syrian refugees, and I do met them, and I started to kind of research why everybody is called Syrian refugees, what is the story, why these people coming, what is their background, because you know what, we are fear the people when we don't know anything about them. Mm -hmm. It's like typical human nature. So I decided to tell the story of refugees. But to tell the story of refugees, you can't without knowing everything before, everything what's happened before. Now, Theory, what's happened in the Western media, we're missing this element from the beginning of the uprising, Syrian uprising, up until all these elements, invasion, how we call it in the press, invasion of uh, the refugees into the Europe. That is absolutely wrong expression. So yeah. this missing link, 11 and 15, I decided to tell, and with this event bring us to the Syrian refugee crisis that happening in our days. This is how it's happened to me. Now, of course, taking in consideration that every story have beginning, middle and end, the point of the Syrian refugees in Europe for me was the ending point of my story. So I needed to tell the middle of the story and the beginning. And for that, I went to the Syrian borders. I went to Turkey, I went to Lebanon, I went to Jordan. And I started to look for the people who've been in a Syrian event, who participated in witnesses. events, who, not necessarily witnesses, I wanted to find the real heroes, the real icons of these events, who've mm. been yeah. essential elements. Like, for example, Abdel Basit Sarud, he is the person who was famous for being a famous goalkeeper, a soccer player, and then he became a voice of the revolution. He became a singer during demonstrations. Then he became commander of the brigades. So for me, he is the icon who, like, been essential element of these things. Or, for example, Riyad al-Assad, who been the highest colonel in the army of uh, President Bashar al-Assad, and in the same time, switched the sides and created Free Syrian Army. So for me, it was essential elements that they're the only ones who can tell the story. Not just the people who witnessed, the people who participated. I needed to know their story. I needed to allow them to voice themselves and tell the story to the world. And specifically, since it started with the kids and the whole revolution started with the kids who've been inspired by the Arab Spring, I was trying to find all these kids who've been a part of the events, who've been a part of the revolution, who've been a part of the war, civil war, or the proxy war that it's right now. And slowly, slowly, I interviewed and I found over hundreds of people who were a part of this, but not just a witness, a part, people who participated. Mm -hmm. And you interviewed, you interviewed a hundred people. Over a hundred. Over a hundred people, and just all over, kind of all over the world. Um, all over the European Union, all over the uh, Middle East, and uh, 
where the most of the people are located. Some of them mm -hmm. still in Syria, some of them uh, between Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, some of them inside of European Union who have been able to cross the borders. So it's uh, crossed, I mean, the borders between the Middle East and European Union. So it's different places, different stories, but together through these stories, I've been able to put a comprehensive story explaining everything versus the small segments of the news that we were exposed since 2015. Yeah, it's very, it's very beautifully laid out in uh, a linear fashion so that you can follow it and understand the cause and effect um, that leads you to the point today where we have a humanitarian crisis. You know crisis. what? It's, it's like a doctor who's trying to treat the disease. You just can't treat the symptoms. You need to treat the disease. So for me, going into the refugee story, I needed to show the roots of this story, right. the roots that caused these events that we are right now kind of uh, struggling. Because remember, this is the biggest refugee crisis since Second World War. They're bigger than what we had in, after the Second World War even. Right, and then we have this uh, this other story that has come in um, with ISIS that has kind of dominated and caused so much fear, but has actually been a distraction to what is actually happening in Syria. So let me also enlighten you, since you saw the movie, what I learned about ISIS, and I had a lot of interaction with the people who've been a part of the ISIS, or who've been... Uh, uh, basically witnessing the atrocities or who were planning to go and have been able to shift their minds. So at the end of the day, portion of the ISIS that was specifically on a Syrian side was created by their president Bashar al-Assad specifically to uh, create destabilization in the country. In 2011, 2012, uh, President Assad releasing two heavy groups of criminals, one became Shabiha, and there were heavy criminals who were doing destabilization during the demonstrations, in the, basically initiate fights between the police and the demonstrators, and then causing really messy situations for the demonstrators when police was using the little, a little weapon. And the another group was heavily affiliated to Al-Qaeda. Now, all these people who were affiliated to Al-Qaeda, they were released in 2011. 2012, they went to Iraq, they went to all other places, and most of them came as two prominent terrorist groups. One was ISIS, another was uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. Right now, it's al-Nusra Front. So, at the end of the day, Assad, like a lot of other dictators, he twisted our attention towards these terrorist groups. They intend, if you will pay attention, since 2013, since the El Ghouta massacre, the entire world not was paying attention to Assad as the criminal who basically prosecuting his own people and fighting against his own people. The entire world was busy with ISIS who dominated, dominated basically did dominate in the media and dominated in the events that happened. But again, what was beautiful, Syrians who at the beginning some kind of believed in the ISIS as the organization that will protect them from Assad. They very fast learned harsh lesson that ISIS and Al-Qaeda, they came not to protect people and fight against Assad, but to basically destabilize the situation. And in the same time, they learned that they are not against Assad. They are doing the old dirty job for Assad mm -hmm. and terrifying the people. So at the end of the day, I think, like I said, in a, inside my movie, I try to put all this comprehensive story so people can be enlightened and educated. Because remember, what's happening with ISIS, we fear them because we don't know anything about them. Mm -hmm. Now, what our, for example, president don't understand when he created travel ban, that to lock the borders, it's not that terrorists not will get inside of our country. In our days, the terrorism operates under different premises. ISIS was strong in their propaganda. I had an ability to interview a lot of sheikhs and a lot of people who've been on different sides. Mm -hmm. And I was explained that there is Islam as a religion and there is ideology that ISIS is practicing mm -hmm. and practicing for their benefit. Now, for example, during Ramadan, the most holiest uh, months for the people who practice in the religion, they are happy, they are praying, worshiping the God, and they having the, the fasting and they having the dinners after the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. 
they are the most peaceful in that moment. For ISIS, it's the most bloodiest period during Ramadan. So you can see the difference mm. between the ideology and the religion. And I learned this. I learned this because for me it was important to educate people and to explain this. Now, what people don't understand, that there is a lot of sleeping cells in United States, in European Union. And to fight propaganda of ISIS, and ISIS right now may be not so strong with their propaganda, but previously they were strong. People who are far away from ISIS, who not like Syrians who've been exposed to atrocities and knowing the truth of ISIS. People on a long distance buying this propaganda and becoming a part of ISIS. That's the problem. So we need to fight ISIS in the same tactics that ISIS did this. So for example, in my movie, I explain in this, I'm showing the true eyes of ISIS, I'm showing the truth about ISIS. And at the end of the day, you know what, I hope more and more people can learn about this, understand what is this. And I hope even our governments, we did the screenings in the, par in, um, in the Congress, uh, bipartisan screenings. So I hope that our government can learn that in our days to fight the terrorism, it's to cooperate with the intelligence and not to just lock the borders. Because, for example, locking the borders against the people who are seeking shelter, we're not fighting terrorism. Kids, you know what is interesting in this situation in the Middle East? We're usually saying that the wars fought between men, adults. Mm -hmm. Here, the kids started the revolution, and the kids mm -hmm. were the targets of all these uh, Islamic groups, like Al-Qaeda, like ISIS. Now, kids also, without afraid, went into the war. I met a lot of kids who were part of Free Syrian Army, who voluntarily went into that. So it was interesting to see the dynamics. And you know what is the problem? If we're shutting our door in front of these who are seeking shelter, these kids, then, you know what, Al-Qaeda or ISIS gladly will provide them, in. yes. Okay, and then, brainwashing. I met kids that been brainwashed by ISIS, and in my movie you saw one of the kids, uh, Ali, I think, 18 years old, he was 16 when he was in ISIS, and I spoke with him, and I said, when you were there, if they were saying to you, kill your mom and kill your family, will you do this? He said, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's horrible brainwashing mechanism, and to reverse this mechanism, it's sometimes, I met with the kids who've been safely reversed back, to the normal life, but it's taking a lot of time. It's from four to six to eight months to reverse the mechanism of brainwashing back. So it is something that we not allowed to happen. We're not allowed that these kids who are seeking shelter will fall in the hands of all these terrorist groups. Otherwise, we're not fighting terrorism. We're creating the terrorism. Yes. Did you did you know when you started working on this project just how important the children of Syria are to the war and to recruitment for ISIS? Like no. They're, they it's are. It's interesting how uh, you mentioned figures this. Figures in your documentary. You know what? For me, I was at the beginning thinking in 2015, in the beginning only about certain elements. It's refugees. It's their story. And then I found myself that I need to tell the story about lost generation. Of, of Syrian kids, but in the same time, when I was finishing the movie, I realized it's not about lost. They're the future generation. And for me, when I'm showing all these three amazing images, horrifying images, we can't say amazing, images that the entire world's familiar, like Ilan Kurdi at the beginning of the movie, the three-year-old child whose body found on the shores of Turkey, mm -hmm. when we see his body, for me, this image kind of symbolizing the death of younger generation because it's how it started. The kids were tortured and killed for simple thing, graffiti. Right. Then, and it was September 2015. Then, last year, when I was in August on the border of Syria, exactly on the 18th of August, I was interviewing Abdel Basset Sarut. It was like second or third interview. You know, Amran, uh, Amran Dahnesh happened uh, to be saved and all this image of the child, five-year-old child in an ambulance, everybody saw, everybody were horrified. For me, this image symbolizing struggle and survival. Yeah. And then Bana Alabed, amazing child, in December 2016, last year again, when she was fleeing from Aleppo and survived this, she is the hope for the future. So all these three kids, like three, five, and seven, it's interesting, three, the Elon, five Amran, seven Bana, right now she's eight, she just been with me in New York. Mm -hmm. And you know what, it's interesting how I can show through these images that people have been connected, all this timeline and all this story of death, 
struggle and survival and hope for the future. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You can see also in the movie how amazingly creative these kids and how inspirational they are, yeah. how much, uh, you know what, beliefs they have, how much optimism they have. For example, we, we've been on Maidan and we were burning the tires. You saw the kids in Aleppo burning the tires to cover everything from the smoke. Uh, covering sm with the smoke so the planes can't uh, bomb the houses or yeah. kids who creating some kind of different variations of the food instead of starving. So it's, it's interesting to see this great spirit of these kids. Mm -hmm. Did you get any uh, reaction from Congress when you screened the movie from them? Did any, have you gotten any reactions from politicians? You know what, it's, in it's interesting because all of them said the same thing like every human after watching the movie asking me, what shall we do? What can we do? Please tell us. It's interesting. And for them it was also kind of a learning process. Like I was telling you about ISIS. For them it was a healthy learning process about a lot of things that they not were just aware of. And right. it's, I hope that the movie, for example, for the first time, I saw that after every Q&A, after every event with the movie, the same question was asked. What shall we do? What can we do? What, uh, how come something like this happening? So it's, it's interesting that the movie is causing the reaction and people ready to do this something. And the Congress actually doing. They, um, in May, when we were doing the, uh, been there, actually what happened, it was a Caesar's bill with the sanctions against Assad and the people who are supporting him, it's passed the house. So slowly, slowly, mm -hmm. our government's working on different uh, suggestions and some kind of uh, things to pres uh, find, the, uh, find the way how to bring stability there back. Right. And you're an American citizen. Yes. And, um, you know, there, a lot of Americans are, uh, they're going to be very enlightened by this because they don't consider like, oh, that my, my child could go to school and a bombing could happen and they could end up just being a, a blood stain on the ground or they could end up having to burn tires to keep, you know, airplanes from bombing their, their apartment buildings or they could, you know, spray some political graffiti and end up being tortured to death. Now they're enlightened. What would you like to see America do? What steps beyond uh, what you've seen Congress do already? I think, first of all, Americans need to be reminded about freedom of speech. Yes. For what these people are fight, uh, fighting since 2011, freedom of speech, human rights, uh, uh, freedom of expression, this is what they're fighting. And I think we, as Americans, need to be reminded about these essential values that were given by the founding fathers. So we need to preserve these things. I, who born in Russia, and I'm an American citizen, I'm so thankful for the United States who gave me all these chances that I can go learn and bring these stories to the entire world. And for example, if I was in Russia, I will, I will be silenced. So at the end of the day, we need to cherish these events because at the end of the day, things like this can happen and we can lose this. We can lose because, you know what, science, what I saw in Syria, what I saw in Winter on Fire in Ukraine and what's happening in our country these days, kind of showing the parallels between the events. For me, what I witnessed there already happening here. Maybe Americans don't realize it, but we are in a civil war. Different type, but we are in a civil war. Do Americans aware that we had, since the beginning of this year, 274 mass shootings? Mm -hmm. I don't think that media somehow brought it up, but we need to stand for what we believe and what we have. Otherwise, we can lose it like this in a heartbeat. And I think for every filmmaker, for every person in my craft who is doing movies and telling these stories, and we as filmmakers, we as documentarians, we have this ability and we're not binded by any networking uh, rules or by any limitations, we have the chance to express ourselves freely. We need to preserve this because otherwise tomorrow we may not be able to tell these stories and you know what, and slowly and slowly we become an totalitarian state. So we need to stand for our grounds. We need to stand for what our founding fathers gave us and we need to cherish this. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question before I let you go. Uh, if you could hand deliver this documentary to somebody, who would you give it to? Oh, that's the really interesting question. Um, I think the world leaders, it's not only one person. I think the world leaders, 
It's the people who are ruling the world. And I think it's not only one person. It just can't come from one person. I think every world leader needs to see this. Every world leader needs to learn from this. And I think it's really important because I saw, I'm going step back, for example, Wind on Fire, my previous movie. Mm -hmm. Look at the Venezuela. Venezuela using Wind on Fire on the streets, showing this on the streets, yeah, underground, really. and it's inspired them to stand against the current dictator. It's all over the news that they used Wind on Fire as the model and as the manual for the revolution. So wow. Ukraine inspired people today. Last year, Brazil was inspired by this movie, and up until today, opposition using this in all their stuff, in all how they're dealing and how they're standing against dictatorship or their president. So it's interesting. So I want the government to see this. I want the government to learn from these lessons. And I want that the people who are on the ground and us, basically, who are the people in this country? We are the people. We are the ones who basically choosing this person or this person represent us in the Congress. So we as Americans, we can easily push the people who represent us in the Congress to do things, to preserve what we have in our hands in order not to lose this. And I think for me, the old governments, the old governments officials need to see this. And I'm trying to do this. I'm doing uh, trainings for Department of Homeland Security. We did events for the Congress. We're doing a lot of things with the use of the movie. So hopefully we can get more and more eyes on this movie. Right. Uh, so, like, you, both of your movies uh, have so much footage uh, by citizen journalists. It's just interesting to uh, know that you want to get across the message to world leaders that um, wherever people are peacefully protesting, there's going to be a lot of phones recording. So the truth will get out there, whether it was Absolutely. the people or or if it was the peacekeepers. That's that, you know, are causing aggression. But I, but I think these days the technology helping to preserve the, the history and in the same time to bring the truth because the technology in these days helping us to fight the wars, I think the technology in these days, this wars what we're fighting right now with propaganda, with all, it's uh, basically the weapon is social media because of a lot of fake news and all kind of propaganda stuff that social created. It's uh, the cameras who creating this stuff. So in our days, cameras and technology as the weapon, and I think it's the weapon that preserves the situations, it's the weapon that can show the truth, and I think it's important to the governments to know the truth and the reality of what's happening in all other countries, and not to allow for their countries to fall into these traps. Right. Yves Jenny, thank you so much for being here. Uh, the documentary is Cries from Syria. You can see it on HBO. Thank you. Thank you.